When The Legend of Zelda Skyward Sword first released on Nintendo Wii, it arrived during an especially unique period in Nintendo's history. This was the tail end of the motion control era, kicked off by the likes of Wii Sports back in 2006. And the Wii itself represented a unique left turn for the Japanese game creator that persisted for years. The integration of motion control into any and all of its games had become the norm during this era, and that applies equally to the Legend of Zelda series. Thus, on its 25th anniversary, Skyward Sword arrived, but the reception was perhaps not as warm as you might expect. You see, at the time of release, many felt that Skyward Sword was somewhat stuck in the past, and it never quite reached the level of popularity you would expect from a mainline installment. Despite the new control scheme, the game failed to push the series forward, but this reception would ultimately give way to Breath of the Wild many years later, where the series took a dramatic turn. And now, thanks to the HD re-release on Nintendo Switch, perhaps it's time to reevaluate Skyward Sword. For me at least, with this new version of the game, something finally clicked, and in this video, I hope to explain why. Part of this is down to smart quality of life changes made to the experience, overcoming many of my original complaints, but equally, with the rise of open world games in the last decade, I've also come to appreciate the more concentrated design of Skyward Sword. Thus today we'll examine the game through this new lens. We'll also stack it up against the original release on Wii, discuss the updated visuals and performance, while examining the two included control schemes and see how they really work. So let's begin. <laughs> At its core, Skyward Sword is perhaps the last in a long mainline of Zelda games built around the concepts forged on Nintendo 64 with Ocarina of Time. From dungeon design, story beats, and progression, it feels like a direct descendant. Each Zelda game between Ocarina of Time up through Skyward Sword builds upon this common ground, while introducing their own unique concepts to keep them fresh. Wind Waker focuses on the sea, Twilight Princess the wolf, and Skyward Sword the motion controls. Using the, at the time, new Wii Motion Plus feature, which adds gyro support to the Wiimote, your interaction with the game was drastically altered from past installments. Now however you may feel about motion controls in general, its arrival makes a lot of sense given the context of the time. After all, many expressed disappointment with the implementation of combat in The Legend of Zelda Twilight Princess. Dreams of swinging the remote around to unleash a flurry of attacks were quickly dashed when it became clear that the swinging motion yielded little more than a simulated button press. Skyward Sword, however, was specifically built to address this. Many of Link's actions would now be directly mapped to the movement of your controller. You could now swing the sword in real time, and Link would react accordingly. But while this worked well, the game itself was bogged down with endless slow dialogue boxes, constant interruptions with your guide character fee, and often slow pacing in general. So when it was announced that Skyward Sword would be arriving on Switch, many of us had questions. How would these issues be tackled? What about the controls? Will they really work on Switch? Is this just emulation or a new port? With this in mind, let's discuss each of these points and more, starting with the game's presentation. In bringing Skyward Sword to the Switch, Nintendo has opted to maintain the look and feel of the original game's art direction, while introducing smart visual tweaks and changes where it makes sense. Some assets have been reworked, the entire UI is completely redone, and of course image quality is hugely improved. Now on Wii, Skyward Sword is limited by its 480p output and reduced color depth, leading to obvious dithering artifacts throughout the image. With HD in the title then, it's no surprise that the resolution has been increased. The port runs at a fixed native 1080p resolution when in docked mode. Color dithering is eliminated entirely and the overall image quality is of course hugely improved. Interestingly, anti-aliasing is not used here, but due to the nature of the texture work, shimmering is kept to a minimum. Yeah. It's not a cutting edge game, but it looks visually pleasing. Texture filtering is also handled extremely well. Of course, in portable mode, the resolution is reduced to the native panel resolution of 1280 by 720, and it looks great there as well, though 
Whether you'd actually want to play in handheld mode is another part of the discussion we'll address shortly. But here's where things start to get interesting. Switch Tinker, Oatmeal Dome, and others, of course, have been examining the game closely, and it turns out there are some neat techniques in play. I don't have all the details, of course, but specifically, they seem to suggest that Nintendo is using a plugin that it developed, translating the GX graphics API calls, which is the native API for the Wii's graphics chip, to Nintendo's NVN API on Switch. Clearly, the idea here is to accurately simulate the visual effects created for the original game, and in that sense, it does seem to work. Between this and other information that has been discovered, it seems that this isn't just an emulation solution, but it does seem to utilize the Wii's original data formats and other aspects of that original release. Much of the game code, however, now runs natively on the Switch CPU, and obviously things like the frame rate have been doubled. But the solution does suggest that we could see future enhanced Wii games appear on Switch with similar improvements. It should also be noted that this solution is not the same as that used for Super Mario Galaxy and Super Mario 3D All-Stars. But of course, this is not just running the original game in HD. There are a lot of other changes to both the visuals and the game itself. So let's start with some visual comparisons here, which reveals numerous things. One of the most unique elements about the game's visuals, then, is this painterly effect used to give it sort of a watercolor appearance. Both textures and the way distant objects are rendered play into this. Essentially, in the distance, objects utilize these small bokeh-like shapes, eliminating the harsh pixel edges you would normally see in a game like this. It's similar in concept to using a depth of field blur, but of course it looks entirely different. Naturally, this look is influenced by the higher rendering resolution on Switch, as it does impact the size of the shapes and the way it interacts with distant objects. On Wii, distant structures also use these thick white lines around edges to further separate that from the horizon. That's still there on Switch, but it's reduced in terms of thickness, again, likely due to the higher rendering resolution. So while the general look of the game is similar between the two, things like distant rendering and the blending of light bloom do differ between the two, and honestly, I feel it looks better overall. But what's perhaps more transformative is the improvements in texture quality. Now, it's clear that Nintendo wanted to maintain the original look of the assets, but in many cases, the actual resolution does seem to have been increased. Due to the painterly nature of these textures, though, it's not entirely clear if these changes are handcrafted or if they relied on something like AI upscaling, but as you can see, there is more fine detail if you look closely. The rug here, for instance, it is much more detailed on Switch. The flourishes on characters benefit as well. In this scene, if I toggle back and forth, note how the texels shift between the two shots. There is definitely more definition on Switch, even if it's somewhat slight in certain cases. On some surfaces, though, it actually almost appears as if it's the paint effect causing the difference. So it does seem to vary. At the same time, on certain oblique edges, the higher resolution mode does seem to eliminate this sparkling bokeh effect that we see on Wii. But hey, at least the shadows are higher resolution. Now, it doesn't appear as if every texture has been updated, mind you, but by and large, surfaces do look clean and it fits the style of the visuals. The world really has this painted look to it, which is pretty interesting and beautiful still today. So it's a faithful conversion of Skyward Sword then, but with key improvements made to the visuals. But there is a lot more. The entirety of the UI has been recreated using much higher resolution assets. Fonts, text boxes, menus, and more all receive a significant upgrade here on Switch. On top of that, due to faster storage, loading between different areas is faster as well. Then of course there's the frame rate. Unlike the previous two Zelda re-releases on Wii U, Skyward Sword receives a boost to a full 60 frames per second, and it's a welcome change. The game is more fluid of course, but what really matters here is that the higher frame rate helps with the motion control aspect of the controls. Basically, it's a lot more responsive when the game runs at 60 frames per second. And by and large, it does maintain 60 frames per second in basically every area but I was able to drop the frame rate in this one specific instance. 
During this boss battle in the second dungeon, if you allow the alpha effects to come in close contact with the camera, it momentarily tanks performance as you can see. But thankfully, this is extremely rare, and I'd imagine you might only see this pop up in other situations where alpha particles flood the screen. Otherwise, we're looking at a locked 60 frames per second. As for portable mode, however, this one's trickier. The switch with portable capture capabilities is a different unit, and I wasn't able to use my save on it. I didn't have the time to replay the game all the way up to this dungeon, and thus I couldn't test this boss fight. But based on the lower resolution and the historical performance of Switch in portable mode, it's likely things will be improved when faced with this same issue. Either way, both modes are extremely smooth. So, it looks nice, it runs well, but there is a lot more to this upgrade than just the visual design. The game itself has a lot of changes which solve many of my original issues with it. So one of the problems with the original Wii release is the constant barrage of text boxes, tutorial text, and helper information. There's so much friction in its original release. Everyone wants to talk to Link or share information with him, and it absolutely slows down the game's pacing. On Switch, however, a lot of this is now completely optional. For instance, this early sequence on Wii. While just running ahead across the island, you're stopped in your tracks to listen to him. This is something that happens throughout the game. It's constant. But over on Switch, you'll see that there's a bubble of interest above this character's head, which is something they've added here. This indicates that they want to speak to you about a quest, but they do not interrupt the player unless they want to speak with them. That's a huge difference right there. Basically, there are far less interruptions. Of course, there's still plenty of dialogue boxes in the game, but unlike the Wii, it's now possible to rapidly button through most of the text. In the original, every line is written out very slowly before you can press a button for the next bit of text. It slows down the game tremendously, especially when combined with the aforementioned issue. This is also no longer the case on Switch. Dialogue sequences are much more enjoyable now due to the speed at which you can move through them. Beyond this, you can even skip cutscenes now by pressing the minus button on the Switch controller, which is useful if you're already familiar with the story or simply have no interest in watching these scenes. Tutorials are even skippable now. So this is point one then. The friction between the game and the player is reduced significantly, making progression feel a lot quicker. But there is more. In the original, when you pick up any random object for the first time, the game stops and explains what that item does. Rather slowly, I might add. The problem here is that if you quit, load your save, and jump back into the game, it does it again the next time you pick up that same item. So throughout the game, you're constantly being barraged with these slow reminders for items that you should already know about. It's frustrating. This has been corrected on Switch. The text only appears the first time you pick up an object, and never again. And of course, the text boxes themselves are faster as well. In addition, the game now has both autosaves and the option to save your game in one of three slots from any save point, adding even more flexibility to the mix. And when using the Joy-Con in a motion control configuration, you also gain full access to a right stick camera. Now this is a standard thing in modern games of course, but this was not possible with the original Wii remote. It didn't have a second analog stick. This simple addition has a huge impact on the gameplay experience. It's simply more enjoyable exploring the world when you have the option to look around. This, along with the higher resolution, makes it a lot easier to parse dungeons in large open areas. Now on the surface, these changes may not seem like a huge deal, but I can assure you that they have a dramatic impact on the overall pacing of the game. It completely changed my view on the experience, allowing you to enjoy the good stuff while keeping these constant annoyances of the Wii version completely in the background. But okay, what about the controls? Now, this is important. Remember, the game was originally designed completely around Wii Motion Plus. So if you use the Joy-Con in a two-handed configuration, the original Wii control scheme is mostly replicated. The main difference here is that you gain access to that right stick camera. There have been some tweaks made to the button layout as well, and I feel it works better overall, but what about the actual motion? Unlike most Wii games, Skyward Sword relies entirely, or almost entirely, on the gyro feature of Motion Plus, 
which the Switch also replicates in its controllers. The thing about gyro control, however, is that it doesn't really have any sort of positional information. It doesn't know where your TV is. So both control schemes allow you to recenter the control based on your hand position by simply tapping a button. But while the game was gyro driven on Wii, the developers did use the sensor bar to help the Wiimote understand where the TV was positioned, which reduces the frequency of necessary recalibration. And that's really the difference here. They function identically, but you need to recenter more often on Switch, and that function is handled with the Y button, it should be noted. Now, if you turn off or unplug your sensor bar on the Wii, it functions more or less like the Switch, though perhaps it's even more error prone, suggesting slightly improved implementation of gyro controls in this new version or in the new controllers themselves. Okay, but what about the gamepad controls? Well, the idea here is that many functions previously relying on motion are now mapped to analog sticks. Flying around on your bird, for instance, that's now analog stick driven. Many gestures are now completely free of the need to move your controller at all. The shield, for instance, is tied to clicking the left stick in. It almost works. There's an issue here, and it ties directly to the sword itself. See, at any point, the right stick serves as your sword. Move the stick, and the sword swings. This works okay by itself, though it is a little fiddly to use. But it also robs you of camera control. Kind of. You see, to use the right stick camera, you have to hold the L button, and at least in my case, this means holding the L button pretty much all the time, except during combat. I feel you're more likely to want to use the camera versus the sword, so reversing this would have helped a lot. Hold a button to bring out the sword, let go to use the camera. But no, there's no such option for this. And fundamentally, that's my biggest issue with this conversion. I do not find the gamepad controls comfortable to use, and as a result, I can't recommend them. This makes playing on something like the Switch Lite rather difficult, in fact. At least with the regular Switch, you can play it in tabletop mode. It's honestly probably the only major thing I really don't like in this new conversion. But thankfully, as I've said, the motion controls work a lot better than I expected, and they have grown on me. Ultimately, I'm really enjoying my time with the game now, a lot more than I did on the Wii. The quality of life improvements, the improved pacing, updated visuals, and smoother frame rate all help smooth over the complaints I had at the time. Now, of course, there are still some pacing issues, you might argue. The teardrop challenges, for instance, can drag on a little long, but all in all, I'm really enjoying it. Now, it's true, you do sort of revisit earlier areas throughout the game, but you also unlock new areas to explore within, and it feels sort of like a Metroid game by visiting places, learning them, and then returning later to do something new. It's satisfying, I feel. Now, before we close up this video, I should also mention the game's audio. Firstly, despite its roots on the Wii, Skyward Sword HD does include full surround sound audio support, with proper rear channel usage something that wasn't truly possible on the original platform. Beyond that, the music still holds up extremely well. It adds a lot to the mood in a way that, I have to admit, games like Twilight Princess and Wind Waker fell a little bit short. I know, sacrilege, but seriously, Skyward Sword sounds amazing. <laughs> So yeah, Skyward Sword HD, it's a game with excellent dungeon design, a beautiful world to explore, and fun mechanics that somehow feels fresher 10 years on from its initial release than it did when it was brand new. 
In that sense, I definitely recommend it, especially if you've been away from this classic 3D Zelda style of game for a while. But that's going to do it for this video, and if you did enjoy it, please consider subscribing or checking out our Patreon. But until next time, thanks for watching.